You're listening to audio from Rosebank Union Church. If you would like to find out more about who we are and what we do, please visit our website at ruc.org.za. We love Joburg, don't we? Now I realize a lot of you out there watching or listening to our service this morning are not from Joburg. One of the amazing benefits of moving church online is we have people joining us on Sunday from all over the country. Uh, recently heard of a family joining us from Bloemfontein. I know we've got regular listeners from Plettenberg Bay, a group of people meeting in Stellenbosch, and of course our missionaries from all over the world are joining together with us every Sunday. But for the most part, most of you out there listening and joining with us this morning uh, Uh, are living here in Joburg or have lived here or are connected to Joburg. And we love Joburg, don't we? Now, granted, Joburg may not be kind of as pleasing in terms of scenery as Plettenberg Bay or Stellenbosch, but Joburg is the very heart of our country's economy. And so as such, we just have such an important role to play uh, here in Joburg as part of the flourishing of our city. And so we have a great sense of purpose as we live and work and have our being in Joburg. But living in Joburg also comes at a cost. The pace of life in Joburg, in any modern city, the pace of life and the stress of life is costing us, costing us our health, our spirituality, our family relationships, and ironically, also costing us our livelihood. So I read a study recently, a study done of thousands of Christians across the world, a study done in 2016 about burnout. Now, I'm pretty sure most of you know what burnout is, but here's a really helpful definition that I found. Burnout is a state of physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual exhaustion caused by living at too fast a pace for too long or by living with too many stresses in our lives. I wonder if we had to do a quick poll, just how many people out there would resonate with that statement. Well, as these guys, this Christian publishing house did this survey, they found that 80% of respondents, Christian people, 80% of them reported signs of burnout lasting most of them for six months or longer. And this was equally divided amongst men, women, single, married, and across all sorts of vocations. The causes of burnout that they discovered in the survey were, here they are just kind of in order of highest cause to lower. So number one, work pressures. Number two, overwork, too little sleep, home pressures, too little exercise, financial pressures, and then strangely, uh, maybe not so strangely, criticism from others. Seven top causes of burnout. Now, here were the effects, again, ranked as Christians listed the major impact that burnout has had on their lives. Number one, they listed it as led them to Sin, increasing presence of sinfulness in their lives. Number two, broken relationships. Number three, needing medical help. Number four, job loss. And number five, divorce. And I think it's really just quite sobering to step back and have a look at these effects. Right, so firstly, sin. So Christians reporting that the pace of life, that the stresses of life was causing them to sin in some ways. And that's the whole point of this rule of life series is understanding that there are unique pressures, unique challenges that come for those trying to live a faithful and fruitful Christian life, but because of particular circumstances, we're going to be compromised. 
And here we see the evidence of that because of the pressure of modern urban life and overwork and stress related to work. It is leading to deformed spirituality. It's the whole purpose behind this series. Secondly, job loss. That's really interesting. It's ironic because you think that if you can just squeeze more into a day, squeeze more into a week, you'll get more done. You'll be more productive. But in the long run, it's hard to be productive if you're burned out. So not helping with productivity. And then thirdly, just worth focusing on, is the effect of burnout. So broken relationships and then in specifically divorce. So besides the damaging effects on our physical health, on our livelihood uh, and our spirituality, one of the biggest losers in our lives because of the unique pressures on us living in this fast-paced modern urban life, biggest losers are our family, families and our relationships within our families. I think it's worth just kind of spending a little bit more time on this. You know, that probably comes about because of the amount of time people are spending at the work. But even if we're not spending just a, you know, too much time at work, by the time you kind of get home from work, you've kind of expended all of your mental energy, perhaps all of your emotional energy. It's given to work. All of that is given to work and there's none left for when you get home. There's a name for that. It's called sunset fatigue. When you arrive home from work and you're just kind of too exhausted to have meaningful conversation with your spouse or your kids, you don't have any energy to, to uh, you know, just relate to them in a helpful way. Or you could be, there's this idea of being home, but you're not really home. It's okay, you've kind of left work behind, but you're not home. And this is exacerbated in lockdown where most people are still working from home. Kind of that boundary between work and home is just dissolved. And so our place of living, our homes have just, work has been integrated there. So you're home, but not home. You're constantly checking your emails. You're constantly thinking about work and taking calls at all times, all parts of the day. And nothing is left for the family. Now, I think most of us out there watching this will know this, but sometimes we just need a, a sharp reminder that when it comes to priorities, there's no competition when it comes to work and family because ultimately, at the end of the day, your company can get another accountant, can get another lawyer, can get another engineer, but your wife cannot get another husband or your husband cannot get another wife and your kids cannot get other parents. Now, before I make it sound like work is the enemy, let me clarify. So when the Bible talks about work, it talks about work as a form of worship. So Colossians 3 verse 23 to 24 says, whatever you do, talking about your work, whatever kind of work you do, work heartily. So work hard as though for the Lord and not for men knowing that you that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving not your boss, not your company or shareholders. You are serving the Lord Christ. So work should be an act of worship. The problem is we've swapped it around. Whereas we should work as worship, we now worship our work. And so the problem leading to burnout and leading to physical, emotional, spiritual, relational breakdown is actually ultimately not the city. It's not Joburg's fault. And it's not, in fact, even the modern pressures of urban life. The problem leading to burn out and sin and break down is ultimately a heart issue related to work, exacerbated by the intense surroundings that we found ourselves in. But ultimately, the problem 
is a heart issue, a worship issue, which is why from the very beginning of the Bible, God has been giving us instruction about how to view our work in its rightful place. And when I say from the beginning of the Bible, I'm not exaggerating. I mean, literally from page two of the Bible. So turn with me to Genesis chapter two, the creation account and read in verse one to three. So thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them, everything else that God did. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. And so God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on that day God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So just hold on a second there. You've got to be thinking this, right? God rested, repeated multiple times there, but God is not a human being with limited physical capabilities like us. God does not need to rest. God is not subject to burning out. What does it mean when it says that God rested? Well, I think there's a few interesting answers to that question, but one of them we know for sure of why God rested rested is this as an example to us and I don't just mean it as an example as like hey guys you should try this thing it's really cool you know no no he made it holy God rested and he made it holy because he rested in other words there's something holy worshipful significant about Resting. So this is what we're talking about in Christian circles when we talk about the practice of the Sabbath. So the Hebrew word in the Old Testament used for rest is Shabbat, where we get our word Sabbath. And there are over 50 reminders in the Old Testament about the practice of taking a Sabbath. And some of you might know that the command to take a Sabbath, to regularly practice rest, is one of the ten holy commandments. Now, just as we did last week, whenever we, we come across these Old Testament practices and commandments, we always got to ask ourselves a question, like how does that apply today in kind of New Testament, New Covenant life? But listen, when it comes to the Sabbath, you really don't have to get caught up in the technicalities of it. Right, because firstly, God did it. He himself rested. So there's that, but also... It being up there, number four, on one of the Ten Commandments. I mean, think about it. It's not often that we would have, you know, kind of a discussion around the binding morality of whether, you know, you should murder or steal. You know, most of us be like, should I murder? Well, no. Like, you know, you do not need to enter into much discussion around the philosophy of some of those commands. So why is it that today when it comes to that fourth command about disrupting the cycle of busyness to rest and worship, we take that one as a suggestion? Like that one is up for grabs. Don't make that mistake. That's what this morning is a reminder of. When this commandment, number four, was inscribed as one of the ten holy commandments. What God was saying was even this, that a society that overworks its people is as brutalizing and as depersonalizing as a society that encourages stealing, murder, and adultery. Now, that's a really dramatic statement. I get that. So let me back that up for you. So Moses, as God gives this covenant to his people on Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments and other laws, which we'll get to in a moment. But now, fast forward 
40 years later, the Israelites are about to enter into the promised land. Moses gathers all the people and he reminds them, hey, here's the covenant. Don't you forget these things. And so he recounts the Ten Commandments and the other commandments. And so Deuteronomy 5, I want to read to you how Moses reminds the people of this particular command. So Deuteronomy chapter 5. And reading from verse 12 to 15, he reminds them, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, not you, your son, your daughter, your male servants, female servants, your ox, your donkey, or any other livestock, or the sojourn or exile who is within your gates in your land, so that your male servant and your female servants may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand, and an outstretched arm. So therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. What I love about Moses reminding the people about this command is he clearly tells them why it's so important to remember the Sabbath. Right? He spells it out in detail. Gives them this very clear list. You stop working. Everybody make it possible for everybody around you to stop working Two, here's why. And it's the therefore, the passage. And he says, he says this, you, you shall remember you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord brought you out. These mighty acts. Therefore, remember the Sabbath is holy. In other words, the reason you should keep this commandment, listen, is to remind yourself you are no longer a slave. The reason communities keep this commandment is to remind themselves we are no longer slaves. It's like Moses is saying in the back, in the, in the back of their minds, I've got the story. For 400 years, you broke your backs serving the Egyptian machine, but then God rescued you. Now you're no longer slaves. So don't go back to acting like slaves. Live as though you are free because you are, in fact, free. See, he's saying you're, you're now tied, not to Pharaoh, an abusive taskmaster. You're not tied to him anymore. You're tied by covenant to a sovereign, loving creator God who has provided everything for you, will provide everything for you for as long as you live. So you do not need to act like a slave anymore. Which is going to take some practice. Hence these commands. Now, when I think about that, the reason for keeping the command to remind ourselves we're no longer slaves. And I think about Joburg. What do you see? And the results of the survey would, would show this. Christians, this modern Israelites now back in Egypt once again. Anyone who cannot obey this instruction to take a Sabbath is a self-imposed slave. When we rest, it's a declaration of our freedom. Now listen, freedom is both a gift, but it's also a skill. It's a gift but it is also a skill. You can be free, but live like you're not free. You know, for instance, if you were sentenced and in prison and then, and then suddenly you, you know, you're released and you're let out into life and maybe some people have testimonies around this, just read stories of how difficult it is to adjust and you end up going back to the same rhythms and routines. You can be free, but live as though you're not free. 
Freedom is a gift and a skill. It takes practice. It takes discipline. It takes reminders. Hence, the sacred rhythm of Sabbath. Hence, this rule of life for modern-day Joburgers and everybody living under these unique pressures. The reminder, the discipline, the training wheels of a rhythm of rest to remind ourselves that we are free. Because living in freedom is more difficult than it sounds. Isn't that crazy? That living in freedom is more difficult than it sounds. I mean, think about what you have to confront in your heart to stop working at least one day out of seven. I mean, this is tough. It was tough even for the Israelites. So the Sabbath command at Mount Sinai given to the Israelites was unique amongst world cultures at the time. I mean, it literally limits profit-making, limits exploitation, limits economic production. So every seventh day, no work could be done. Every seventh year, no work could be done. More about that in a moment. But ultimately what that means is that in the short run, Israel was less economically productive, less economically prosperous than her neighbors because of this command. But she was free. So what you are confronted with in taking a sacred rest is, on the one hand, yes, this idea of I could be more prosperous. I can be productive seven days a week, short term at least. I could make more money. I could make more sales. And so you're confronted partly with materialism and greed. On the one hand, prevents people taking that break because I could make more. I always want more. But secondly, we are confronted with our fears. If I stop and don't work, then maybe I won't be able to provide for my family. Which is a noble fear, but still unfounded when it comes to being a citizen of the kingdom of God. And God was saying this to the Israelites. You're in covenant with me. I'll provide for you. But it took them so long to learn that if ever they did. And I mean, it even got harder. So yeah, every seventh day, stop from your work and rest and make sure the people around you can rest too. But then every seventh year, this is crazy, every seventh year was like a super Sabbath. It's called a, and then it was seven cycles of seven years and this whole jubilee idea. But the super Sabbath, and every seventh year, slaves released, all your debt canceled. Imagine that. Do you remember you're just a home learning guy? Just disappears in year number seven. You know, you're just free from your company and can find any other company. You know, it's slaves released, debt is erased. But also in that seventh year, not allowed to work the land. One whole year of no agriculture. Now think about that in terms of, oh my gosh, but how are we going to eat? We've got to work the land to eat, but God specifically reminds them. You can read this, Leviticus chapter 26. God reminds them, I will provide for you. You'll see. You won't work the land, but I will cause the land to still provide enough for you. Trust me, not your productivity. Again, a little bit easier said than done, but that's why the heart of this commandment comes back to our belief in God. And I trust in him. So Leviticus, when this discussion is happening, 26 verse 13, I am the Lord your God. Huh? Reminder, you're not God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Let's remind you of that, that you should not be their slaves. This is a different text to Deuteronomy. It has the reminder again. You should not be slaves again. And I've broken the bars of your yoke and made you walk upright. That's the heart of this Sabbath idea, this practice of stopping and resting. I delivered you from slavery. I'm your God. I want you to walk up straight, not with these broken backs. Now, that's not generally what I see when I look around Jersey. 
And that's not what results of surveys would indicate. What results of surveys are indicating is people are walking around with bent, broken backs, acting still like we are slaves. And it's time to remind ourselves that we're free. And we do that by intentionally practicing a day where we stop from work and instead worship. Remind ourselves we're not God. God is God. So let's just backtrack. Let's recap a little. We started by saying that our struggle with the pace of life is a worship issue, a heart issue. We've already seen how fear and greed is what is causing our excessive schedules. But there's another deeper level operating here, another heart issue. The reason we often worship our work is because of deeper identity struggles. As human beings, we have three very basic God-given emotional needs. Significance, self-worth, and security. Basic human needs, you know this deep down. The need to feel significant or the need to feel like your life has a purpose. Your being here matters. We need to know that. Significance, self-worth, the need to feel loved, accepted, and valued apart from what we look like or our achievements. It's just intrinsic self-worth basic human need and then third security to know that despite the craziness we're going to be okay that everything's okay three basic human emotional needs the biggest change in my life on a spiritual level biggest change happened on the day that I realized in a youth leader camp and at a workshop that those three basic human emotional needs that I was very much aware of, are fully and completely met in Jesus Christ. God gave us those needs, but He means for us to find their fulfillment in Him and in the work that Jesus has done. So, for example, the need for significance, to feel like my life has a purpose, He's met in this the good works prepared before us, before the world began, that Christ died to make available to us, that we could walk in them. There's your real sense of purpose, what God has for you to do, and part of that is attached to your work. Significance, self-worth, the realization that I'm fully completely loved by God for God showed his love for me while I was a sinner Christ died for me God shows his love for us while we were sinners he died for us it's the whole gospel message you are loved completely valued infinitely before while we were sinners I mean no one else is going to meet that no human being can demonstrate that kind of self-worth can't fill those needs well we try all the time put that burden on other people some then i'm meant to fill that need only god can and insecurity just knowing at the end of the day the truth in my heart god is sovereign and therefore i'm safe and secure now listen worshiping our work I think, mostly comes out of trying to fill those needs ourselves in our work. Worshipping our work, this excessive stress and busyness and the schedules comes from trying to fill the need for significance, self-worth and security through our work. In other words, I'm going to prove to people that I'm significant. I'm going to become indispensable. And there's a sense of kind of pride. I can't take leave because the company's going to collapse. There are too many people depending on me. 
And it's, we play this martyr card all the time. Why, why do you think it is that we walk around with, you know, like a busyness is a badge? You know, I heard this anecdote. It must be an urban legend and can't be true. But anyway, it, it kind of makes the point about this foreigner that came to the U.S. On a, on a conference, couldn't speak English really well, started introducing herself as busy. Hi, my name is busy. Why? Because that's how people just seem to introduce themselves all the time. Hi, name's Richard. How are you doing? I'm busy. We are busyness like a badge. Why? Because it makes us feel significant. We're achieving something. And we try and achieve or fulfill a need for self-worth. People will value me. They'll recognize me. I'll finally show them that I'm worth something by making it, by climbing the corporate ladder, as it were, or by all these showing them through my possessions, my position, my titles. To prove that I'm valuable. Which never really works, does it? And lastly, security. I mean, I get that. I can be safe. It's up to me. I've got to do this so that I can have all that I need. The cause of our relentless busyness and endless pro productivity it's not just a rejection of the freedom we have as citizens in the kingdom of God. But it's also caused by a rejection of what Jesus Christ came to purchase for us. To meet these needs. That's why that passage that we read before the, before the sermon started where Jesus is engaging with the religious leaders on the Sabbath and they had made all these laws around and made it all legalistic. But he ends and he says this, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. I'm Lord of the Sabbath. What did he mean? I mean he, meant, he meant so much that I can't get into now, but at the very least what he meant is I am the fulfillment of Sabbath. In other words, in me... You will truly find rest. You will be able to stop your striving for significance, for self-worth, for security. All those needs find their fulfillment in me and therefore in me, you can have rest. Yes, physical rest, but more than a deep, deep inner soul rest. Which is why in that passage before he even gets to engaging the religious leaders, Jesus says those words, some of the most beautiful words in the whole Bible. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, for I will give you rest. He's just promising a good night's sleep or a nice holiday but a deep fulfillment of those desires so that we can now be free and now free to work as worship. So free to engage with our work, using it as a, as a place of creativity, of stimulating intellectual pursuits, of fulfilling activity and labor, of opportunity for relationship of contributing positively to our society, to our city. You could free to work, but now you're doing it as unto the Lord. Not because of any of the other pressures that suffocate around us and choke our freedom out of us. In other words, you're doing this, you're working and working hard, heartily, but doing this as somebody who's both received the gift of freedom and has learned the skill of practicing it in their everyday lives. May God help us practice that skill of freedom in the everyday lives and the difficult circumstances we find ourselves in. Let's pray. God, we truly do come to you asking for your help here. And God, I just think of the many, probably hundreds out there who are burnt out, burning out, 
exhausted, weary, physically weary, emotionally weary, spiritually struggling with relational breakdown. We were like this before pandemic, before lockdown, and it, God has just made it so much harder on us. And so, God, we pray, we come before you as your people. We come to you, Lord Jesus. You promised us with your words, come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. And Lord Jesus, I pray this morning, we trust in you, Holy Spirit, to work in our hearts in such a way that we experience the release the freedom that is the gift you gave us that came at the cost of your own blood and your own life. And we experience it deep in our souls. But God, Holy Spirit, you would guide us to make practical changes to our lives, to practice the freedom that we have. We need your help. And Jesus I pray to you just on behalf of the many out there who perhaps have never quite had the vocabulary to put to these longings for significance. <laughs> these longings that perhaps experienced since childhood. Perhaps those who've been told that their life has no meaning or value, that they're useless or worthless have had that abuse on them. For those that never felt just valued and loved and accepted for who they are and have always felt like they've had to earn that in their families or in their uh, groups around them, in friendship circles, who felt the weight of trying to prove your worth. And for all of us, God, I'm pretty sure, most to all of us, anxious about our needs at this time. So we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help us to see through your death and your resurrection how you, you fulfill all these needs. How our fear dissipates, our greed dissolves, and our need for significance, self-worth, and security is fulfilled in you alone. Help us to know that truth and to live it out from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to this sermon from Rosebank Union Church. If you've enjoyed this message, please feel free to share it with others. And if you would like to support the work of Rosebank Union Church, please visit the giving link on our website at ruc.org.za.